Good morning, afternoon and evening to everyone who might be joining us or in the process of joining us for today's seventh installment of the London Society seminar based around a reading of Lacan's seminar 17, The Other Side of Psychoanalysis. Now, for those of you who are already able to hear this, I suppose it's redundant to mention that there have been apparently, there has been yet again a Zoom update overnight. And so some people might find that they're having a difficulty with their initial connection because it might take a while for their computer to update, to load the update. But I suspect if you can hear that message, you've already solved the problem and it's those who are struggling to connect it who will not be able to hear it. Um, I will actually then just take the chance to remind everyone that we do have recordings of previous sessions for anyone who might have missed some essential elements of the work, which due to the diligent and painstaking editing work of Phil Dravers of the London Society are now available on the website of the London Society for you to listen back to, to previous seminars if you have the time not just to keep up with the weekly seminars, but to look back over the, the work we've already covered. Um, I will also mention, while I'm at it, that on the London Society website, you will also find the list of references associated with each chapter, which has been carefully compiled on our behalf by Oriel Cabacho, member of the London Society, who is compiling not just the associated references with each chapter, but also the key references mentioned by each speaker in the course of their presentation. So anyone who feels that they have time on their hands during this period of confinement and might want something further to do besides reading Lacan will find a vast list of further lateral references to pursue in relation to this seminar. Today, <clears throat> we arrive at the seventh installment the chapter entitled Oedipus, Moses, and the Father of the Horde. You will remember that when we launched this seminar, it was designed under the initial moment of suspense due to the pandemic to provide a way for us to continue working under these conditions and also almost to provide an artificial parenthesis of 12 weeks of work for us to pursue, to mark our working trajectory towards an uncertain future, even if just as a way of marking the passage of time through this period of suspense, a, a way of counting off the weeks. I know my own subjective experience of the time during this period has not been the same. To start with, when we had all these weeks ahead of us, time was almost stationary. Everything was in suspense. Time was moving very, very slowly. Now that, shall we say, we have more weeks behind us in this period of week of work than ahead of us, I certainly find that time is, is moving a little bit more quickly. And there seems the work certainly hasn't stopped and the tempo is picking up. Um, of course, the future that we are working towards remains unclear. We still don't, are not particularly well prepared for it. There are certainly elements of the uncalculable that continue waiting for us, unless, shall we say, we find ways to factor in that incalculable element of loss, the element of trauma that we've, each one of us has experienced as individuals, but also as, as a culture. The images currently emerging from the United States of America are perhaps an indication that it's not simply going to be a question of reopening the doors and going on as before, going back to business as usual, without some way to mark something of what has changed during this period, to mark a place for that still incalculable loss, which otherwise is still to come. Some of the images, even in this morning's newspapers, of the protesters confronting the police, the, the armed guards, 
I find strikingly reminiscent of some of the images from the, the time of this very seminar, Seminar 17, 50 years ago, of the students in Paris confronting the police. Um, something that was going on not in Paris and other locations in France, but in the United States as well, with the students protesting against the, the Vietnam War. But what struck me most of all in the images from today's press are the images of fire, of conflagration. On one hand, this brought home to me the idea of the degree to which, let's say, in the historical imagination of the English, or at least in my own historical imagination, which is sketchy at the best of times, the degree to which the notion of the great plague of London is tightly associated with the great fire of London, which happened in the successive year. So part of the English historical imagination is this close coupling between the great fire and the great plague, including the degree to which that great fire, that incendiary, had almost an imaginary effect of, of purification, of, of purgation after the suffering of the plague. One obvious difference, shall we say, is that that fire was not started deliberately. The, the effect of destruction and burning that we are seeing happening in the United States at the moment maybe provide a small indication that if we don't find a way to mark that loss, to include that loss in our calculations, in our discourses, we are always in danger of being precipitated in a new sacrificial logic of destruction and devastation that would have unfortunate effects that would be difficult to manage at a political, a social, and a subjective level. All of this simply as a brief indication to mark our current point of entry into this particular chapter, which itself picks up on the theme of loss and castration that we've seen pursued in the first part of this seminar, but not on the side of prohibition and the law, but on the side of a loss that might be intrinsic to jouissance itself, some kind of confrontation with the impossible intrinsic to jouissance. We will thus see Lacan working out not just the question of the father, the father of the Oedipus complex of totem and taboo of Moses and monotheism, but a new formulation of the paternal metaphor that would not be a myth, associated with a reading of the Oedipus complex as Freud's dream, as, as an index of something of Freud's desire that makes possible a critique of the psychoanalytic clinic's reliance on the paternal function. Thus, there's plenty for us to do and plenty of work for us to be getting on with in today's chapter. Before I introduce Alexander Stevens to guide us through this chapter, I will just mention that Rick Luce will be today's discussant, who will be posing some questions to Alexander, along with the contributions of our worthy and faithful panel who have also accompanied us with their work and their presence on the screen and their, their, their physical input into the work of, of this seminar, which has made this seminar, shall we say, a work of many voices. It gives me great pleasure then to introduce Alexander Stevens today, um, who is a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst based in Brussels. He's a member of the ECF and the NLS and the World Association of Psychoanalysis. He is the founder and therapeutic director of Le Courtil, the Institute for Psychoanalytic Work with Children, for ch with Children with Psychosis and Autism in Belgium, which is not the same institute as the one that we mentioned last week in relation to Bruno de Halle, the Antenna 110. Le Courtil was a groundbreaking institute developing treatments for autism for, uh, with children. If any of you are aware of the film, Like an Open Sky, which may in fact be accessible via the internet, 
you yourself ca can have a taste of the kind of psychoanalytic work that is available at this in at this institution which has also served as a training center for Lacanian analysts in that field for multiple generations. Alexander is also currently the vice president of the new Lacanian school. We look forward to hearing plenty more from him when he takes up his role as president in a time to come. But in the meantime, it gives me great personal pleasure to welcome Alexander Stevens to speak to us about Oedipus, Moses, and the father of the Horde. Alexander? <coughs> thank you, Roger. Uh, I thank you too to, to have uh, made some correction of my English on my text last night. <laughs> it would be better so. Thank you very much. Then this uh, chapter seven of the seminar is devoted to the place of truth and to the analyst discourse with the question of the father as a Freudian myth. I've divided my uh, intervention in some points. Then the first is the master discourse masks the divided subject. Analysis draws its importance from the fact that the truth of the master discourse is masked. Lacan said that at the beginning of this chapter. In other words, the principle of the master discourse is to think of oneself as univocal. The master masks the subject, reducing him to an S1. The subject who expresses this S1 does not want to know that he is dived and only represented in this S1. It is the I of the master, the I identical to itself so as Lacan presented on page 62 of this seminar, or also on page 90, where he specifies the master's discourse begins with the predominance of the subject as tending to be supported only by this ultra reduced myth of being identical with his own signifier is to say that the divided subject of the master discourse think he is as one refusing the division. What does the master's discourse mask? It is, it is, sorry, it is the division of the subject. In the master's discourse, the barrett S come in the place of truth and therefore takes advantage of this to mask itself. The truth is only possible to, to say as an half saying. And the master wants to say everything. It is on the basis of the psychoanalytical discourse, of the psychoanalytic act, in fact, that we can say that the subject is not univocal. Lacan refers here to the development he made in 1968 in his seminar, L'Act Analytic, the analytical act. He formulates there are many characteristics of I think. I think could be what I dreamt, as I quote him, what I dreamt last night, what I missed this morning, and so on. It's to say expressions of the unconscious. And Lacan asks, in this I think, Am I there? And he replies, I was in it, but in the same sense that this very specific use of the imperfect in French, which gives us all its ambiguity to the expression, I said first in French, un instant plus tard, la bombe éclatait. Another second, and the bomb was gone off, which means that precisely it did not go off, go off. Lacan took this example from the linguist Guillaume. It's a kind of tense from the verb to the imperfect, which functions like an unrealized future perfect. 
the this what Jack Alain Miller says in the fifth of his sixth paradigm of jouissance. I quote him, if the subject is represented, it is to the extent that it is never presented, to the extent that it is never in the present. This is the division of the, of the subject. There where I think I no longer am. It remains for us to choose. Either I do not think or I am not. In the seminar on the analytical act, this is developed in articulation between the two movements of alienation and separation. But as uh, Miller remarks in the fifth paradigm, this articulation between alienation and separation, and separation is now unified as when in the discourses, the place of the divided subject and the object little a is articulated in each discourses. And this is evident in the Easter eggs discourse. There where I am thinking, I do not recognize myself. I am not. This is the unconscious. And there where I am, I am lost. And it's, uh, I quote uh, Lacan in this seminar, it's on page 103. The two, two movements are part of the same question. The subject partakes of the real precisely in that it is impossible, apparently. And Lacan makes the comparison with physical particles, which can be considered either as particles or as waves, apparently impossible, but yet so. This is what the master's discourse masks. Of course, you see what seems to be a paradox. The, ma the master discourse, which hides the divided subject, is also the discourse of the unconscious. But this is only an apparent paradox. The analysant must enter into the hysterics discourse to put his unconscious, unconscious at sorry to work. Second point, the crushed truth of the university discourse. What comes in place of truth is essential for meaning of each discourse. Truth is not a question, c'est Lacan, except for the administrators. He refers on that occasion to the question, what is truth? By, and he precise by whom that was eminently pronounced. It's a reference to Pontius Pilate, Pilate in the New Testament. It is during the trial before Pilate when Jesus said, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. And I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Then Pilate responds, what is truth? It's not the same to hear the enigma in what is said or to ask the question. For him, a pilot, it is not an, an enigma, it's a question. As if the whole truth could be said. The administrator erases the part of enigma present in the truth by reducing it to a question. In the university discourse, it is S1 which comes at the place of truth. The truth of science in its cur current movement is without subject, but with the master signifier insofar as it brings the master's order. The truth of science is so quashed or crushed, écrasé, c'est Lacan in French, it is not masked as the master discourse, as in the master discourse, but it is limited to having to bring the master's order. The master order is continue 
march on, keep on knowing more and more. That's uh, what say Lacan in, on page 105. We can also read it with the current situation of the epidemic. Knowledge as a categorical imperative is what is asked from the experts instead of first recognizing a part of non-knowing. It was very clear that everyone wanted to know everything. What exactly is the risk? How to protect ourselves? Are masks useful? Is there a drug? Where, when a vaccine? And so on. The disarray of experts and official governments clearly demonstrate this. First of all, we must recognize a part of not knowing. But the requirement of science is keep on knowing and the fact that the S2 is in the first place, the place of the comment, forces you to say what you know when you are a scientist or simply in that university discourse. The pure no knowledge of the master does not stop. But in the university discourse, the master is not more present. It is the comment that remains. There is no longer any need for anybody to be present, say Lacan. It is a pure master signifier. It's not necessary <coughs> to have somebody to say it. The signifier, the master signifier, works alone. This is for Lacan without the slightest idea of progress and it does not appear certain that the truth is necessarily beneficial. Third point, the truth in the analytical discourse. <clears throat> in the analyst discourse, Lacan says on page 106, it's uh, point two, that the position of the analyst it is the object A itself that comes to the place of the comment. That is to say, with what present itself from the subject as the cause of desire. That's what Lacan says. It is interesting to note that Lacan named the place at the upper left of the discourse, the place of the comment. And on page 93, in the previous session of the seminar, he named the same place, place of desire. Patricia Tassara commented it some weeks ago when presenting what Lacan says on page 69. The analyst discourse, who has, been, who has to be located at the opposite of any wish, at least any declared wish for mastery. This question is already present in the text, the direction of the treatment and the principles of its powers in the écrit. <coughs> Where he writes that a psychoanalyst directs the treatment, but he must not direct the patient. And Lacan adds a little further uh, that it is a power on the condition that he not use it. In the analyst discourse, the comment is limited to be the cause of desire, incarnating as a semblant, the jouissance of the analysant as, as lost and recuperated as little a. I remember a little comment that Jacqueline Miller made uh, in, uh, <coughs> in a seminar a long time ago, about the direction of the treatment and these sentences, saying that Lacan precise in the direction of the treatment that it is a power to the condition, on the condition that he not use it. And when he write the discourse, putting the little a on that place of comment, he resolved this, uh, this little problem, the power that he not use it, little a, 
is, uh, <coughs> is not a signifier. It gives no power uh, as a semblance. <coughs> <coughs> It's a power on condition of no use. Because as Lacan says it on page 107 of the seminar 17, in the structure of what is called the analyst discourse, the analyst you see, you see, says to the subject, off you go, say everything that comes into your head, however divided it, it may be, no matter how clearly it demonstrates that either you are not thinking or else you are not or else you are think you are nothing at all it may work what you produce will always be admissible this is what is written in the right part of the matem of the discourse of the analyst the ballot as above this indicate either you are not thinking or you are not that's a divided subject and the s1 as product at the bottom right as when what you produce as signifier <coughs> what is then the s2 knowledge in the place of truth in the analytical discourse in the master discourse the subject finds himself bound to the master signifier, whereas knowledge brings about his insertion into jouissance. But what knowledge could be transmitted from the analyst's discourse? Lacan, Lacan gives us a kind of response here in a style a bit teasing, un peu taquin. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> in, the <uni> <coughs> in the university discourse, you have to pick, you have to keep on knowing, but also you have to see what you know. In the current time, we see that each day with the experts and the virus. You have to say us all what you know. And of course, it's impossible because they do not know everything and that leaves open a place for many kinds of fake, fake news. Lacan takes us as example for knowledge in the position of truth, the fact that he has not to say what he knows. It is for instance, say Lacan, it's on page 109, what justifies my saying that since at one time they gadget me when I was about to speak about the names of the father, I will never talk about them again. I will, it will remain a secret. Jacques Alain Miller commented this in De la Nature des Semblants his course in 1991. In the session of November 27, he says, what is the secret of the names of the father that, that Lacan refused to say? The secret is given in the title. The names, plural, implies that the father, singular, goes away with the secret. The father's stamp is empty. It is the same as what Lacan says in the écrit on page 693. Moses' stamp is as empty for Freud as Chris was for Hegel. Abraham, Abraham revealed his mystery to neither of them. Miller commented this by saying that approached from the signifier there is only a lack. The mystery is that of the object little e. The analyst has not to say what he knows, but to measure the effects of what he says. It is the question of the interpretation and of the analytical act. There is a choice 
that can be made about what is need of clarification. Uh, Lacan said that on page 109. In the position of truth, we can only speak through a half thing. It is impossible to transmit the jouissance in terms of knowledge, except a half thing that makes truth the, the sister of jouissance. Lacan evoked his non-existent seminar, the names of the fathers. On that moment, in this chapter, because the title of this seminar, the names of the father, takes us one thing. The plural indicates that the name of the father does not exist. It is a myth, precisely a structural rewriting of the Freudian Oedipus complex. The plural undoes the belief in the father and lets us on the path of the symptom, knowledge in the place of truth in the analyst discourse is also occupied by myths. And the next session of, his, of this seminar will bring us from myth to structure. <coughs> Fourth point, the structure of myth. On the structure of myth, Lacan refers to Claude Lévi-Strauss and his text, The Structural Study of Myth. In this work, Lévi-Strauss tells us his method for analysis of myths, and he takes as example the Oedipus myth. <coughs> I want to comment a little this text of Lévi-Strauss because uh, it interests and it, it interests Lacan, and uh, I think it gives us um, a possible understanding of this question of uh, uh, the fact that Lacan said that Oedipus is only a myth. So Clévis Strauss does not tell, tell us the myth, or rather, he does not draw his analysis from the story that the myth tell, tells us. He begins by cutting the myth into, in, into in a series of elements, the mythems, which he classifies according to the relation they have with each other. For example, in the myth of Oedipus, he takes the elements which testify to a reproachment between the members of the family, one of them is Oedipus who married his mother, another Antigone who buries his bro her brother despite prohibition, and on the other hand, those which, which testify, take them in, on the other hand, those which testify to a violent opposition between them, between members of the same family. For example, Oedipus kills his father, or Eteocles kills his brother, Polynices. And he does the same with the relationships between humans and monsters. To do this, he uses the complete myth of Oedipus, as Lacan notes it, not only the play by Sophocles, but all that precede, precedes and that which follows, that's to say also the story of his sons and Antigone. It is from this double set of oppositions in the family and between human and monsters that he draws his conclusion. As Lacan says, Lévi-Strauss affirms that two mutually contradictory relations are identical. This is a mode of half saying. I will not give you a complete demonstration of the study of the myth of Oedipus that Levi Strauss offers us, but I was interested to understand the seeing of Lacan on page 111. I quote Lacan 
one can see that it concerns something quite different from whether or not one is going to fuck one's mommy. Indeed, Levi Strauss puts in, in relation the double opposition between, on the one hand, the positive and negative family ties, and on the other hand, the links maintained with the world below, that of the monsters, Oedipus kills the Sphinx, for example, and the defect that persists in men, such as, such as that of not walking straight, which testify that they come from a lower world, Oedipus pierced feet, for example. From this double opposition, he concludes the meaning of the Oedipus myth as follows. That's then the conclusion of Levi's truth. The Oedipus myth has to do with the inability for a culture which holds the belief that mankind is autochthonous, it's autochthonous, it's to say coming from a lower world, from moist earth, as Posanias says, to find a, a satisfactory transition between this theory and the knowledge that human beings are actually born from the union of man and, and woman. The Oedipus myth, says Levi Strauss, provides a kind of logical tool which replaces the original problem in these terms, the, the, the original problem, born, born from different or born from the same. And he goes on to say that the Freudian problem is still the problem of understanding how one can be born from two. How is it that we do not have only one procreator, but a mother plus a father? It is clear that it is not only the question of fucking or not the mother, but it also enables us to perceive some basic logical processes which are at the root of, medic, myth, of mythical thought. <clears throat> it is a way from myth to structure. A myth is an attempt to say about real what cannot be said otherwise. It is a half saying. Analyze it in this way. The myth tries to say the impossible in some kind of imaginary structure. This will also be developed in the next chapter of this seminar. It is so that it is an attempt to approach the real of a half saying in an half saying. The myth is an S2 in position of truth. Lacan said that. When we see the, pl the place where knowledge comes in the four discourses, it is extremely clear that it is not the non Sorry. It is extremely clear that it is not the knowledge of university or science, which aims for completeness, nor the knowledge that the master is extracts from the slave. The myth, the kind of uh, knowledge that uh, we, we may see in myth, is doubtless closer to the knowledge produced by the hysteric. But it is as knowledge about the real, which cannot be said completely, that, that is to say, in a position of truth, that the myth takes all its value. If the meaning that Claude Lévy Strauss derives from the Oedipal myth interests Lacan, it is because it leaves to one side the content of the story told and approaches a structure which says something of a real where the function of the impossible appears. Fifth point, the Freud's dream. In the last part of this chapter, 
Lacan puts a series of sorry. In the last part of this chapter, Lacan puts in series three Freudian myths about father. Oedipus, Totem and Taboo, and Moses and Pondotheism. At the end of this session, Lacan says that the Oedipus complex is a Freud dream. On this point, Lacan distinguishes himself from Freud and even opposes him. He tells us, as Bruno Duallet pointed out in the previous session, that the Oedipus is strictly unusable. It's on page 99. <coughs> Except, say him, as, is, as this coarse reminder of the mother's value as an obstacle to all investment in any object of the cause of desire. And he says also in the chapter 7 that it is of no use for psychoanalysts. Jacques-Alain Miller comments on these last pages of this chapter in his course of March 21, 2003, An Effort de Poésie. This course is not translated into English. Miller noticed this, the, the disagreement of Lacan with the Freudian formulation of the Oedipus complex. After formalizing the Oedipus complex in the form of the name of the father, Lacan reduces it here to a myth. It's the first time, I think, that Lacan presents the, Freud, the Freudian Oedipus as a myth. As Jacques Lacan puts it, sorry, as Jacques Lamillère puts it, a myth is the dressing up, l'habillage, the covering of a structure. And in formulating the name of the father, Lacan has already removed a skin, a skin of the dressing up. <coughs> in this chapter, Lacan first recalls the small structure he had built much earlier with the crocodile and the stone roller to prop in its shows at the level of the tap. It is an imaginary presentation of a small logical structure which says that the jouissance of the mother is stopped. He himself never spoke of the Oedipus complex, but he formalized this prohibition in the name of the father. The presentation of the paternal metaphor can be found in his text on psychosis in the Écrit. In the seminar held the following year, Desire and its Interpretation, Lacan questions with his studio of Hamlet the central status of the paternal metaphor. The figure of Hamlet's father is indeed a figure of a castrated father. And Lacan concludes, the big secret of psychoanalysis is that there is no order of the order. This is what Miller has shown to be Lacan's rejection of the function of the name of the father as a guarantee. <coughs> In his course from 2003, an effort de poésie, Miller shows us the evolution of Lacan around the question of the prohibition of jouissance. He says, the forbidden, the prohibition, is only a meaning which is given to jouissance, only a meaning to what in jouissance does not reach its, its fulfillment. Prohibition, is not real, just a meaning. And Miller adds that what has guided Lacan in its various versions is to demonstrate that it is jouissance as such that does not allow its accomplishment. So in his text, the subversion of the subject, Lacan says this, it is, it's a text that you find in the écrit, we say that uh, 
put his seats on page 696. Lacan says this, it is not the law itself that bars the subject's access to jouissance, for it is pleasure and an almost natural barrier. A pleasure is a limit for jouissance because it installs a return to homostasis in place of the unlimited aspect of jouissance. Miller says that he puts the measure of pleasure in place of the forbidden. It is a new formulation of the paternal metaphor, which Miller writes in a little matin. I printed, I printed for you this little matin, and I'll show it to you. Uh, I'll share my screen to show it to you. So, uh, so you see it. Please, not, you see it? Not, not yet. Not yet. That's a problem then. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, yes. Now you see it. Now we see it. Before we didn't. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> we, we learn Zoom progressively. <laughs> then you see the, the, the first, the paternal metaphor is when the name of the father limit the desire of the mother it's the desire of the mother one of the name of jouissance in the lacanian text uh, on psychosis it limited and the new made the new uh, matin that miller proposed in lacan is that it is pleasure finite finite pleasure to limit uh, who limit which limit the jouissance, uh, which is infinite. The father is the law, the mother the whim, the caprice in French. In the paternal metaphor, it is the law that prohibits jouissance. The law then of the matter of the name of the father. Instead of, instead of this, in the new metaphor, it is as natural pleasure that introduces a limit in the limitless jouissance. In the seminar, the other side of psychoanalysis, we discover one more step in this direction. Beyond the Oedipus complex, such is the title of this second part of the seminar. It is no longer the prohibition, nor the pleasure that limits the enjoyment. It is a loss internal to jouissance itself. Instead of the ban, there is a loss. A sixth point, three myths. Lacan here interprets the Oedipus complex with totem and taboo. Certainly he is ironic about the father of the order when he says, you find that on page 113 and 114, Freud holds that this was real, but it is a cock and bull story. In French, in Histoire dormir debout. Also, when he says, we have seen orangutans, but not the slightest trace ever, has ever been seen of the father of the human horn. In the text Litody, two years after this seminar, he makes a joke with that. He said, the Oedipus is redoubled by the comedy of the Père Orang, the Père Orang of the perorating Otang. It's a joke with the pair or rank between father, pair, and entering the language perorating, pair or rank. In Spain, French, pair or rank, it's the father or rank, and it's perorating. It's to say entering the language. And he say also mocking, it's a funny idea. The old daddy had the woman 
or to himself. Strange idea. Perhaps they too, the women, may have their own little idea. Is then mocking with this uh, myth. But Lacan maintains the assertion that totem and taboo makes it possible to reinterpret Oedipus. It must be seen that these two myths are opposed. In Oedipus, the murder, the murder of the father allows the jouissance of the mother in the two meanings of the jouissance which the mother finds with her child and that, of that, and that of the child himself. It is because he kills his father that he can marry his mother. Of course, he does not know, but the fact that it is unconscious does not change the structure that can be said thus, if we kill the father, we can have jouissance with the mother. That is the form of the Oedipus myth. This is why the Oedipus complex introduces the ban in the form of being afraid of the father. It is the forbidden that it is to see the law which, civiliz which civilizes by limiting jouissance, prohibiting infinite uh, jouissance between mother and child and allowing for later a recovery of pleasure. The surplus jouissance. In Totem and Taboo, the opposite occurs. After killing the father, the brothers forbid the jouissance with the mother. There are, there are here two differences with Oedipus. First, in Totem and Taboo, it is the murder of the father that prohibits jouissance. While in Oedipus, it is the mother, the, sorry, it is the murder that allows it. Lacan points out that it is very strange that murder prohibits jouissance because the brothers could have shared the little could have shared the little mummies they could exchange since the old father had all had them all. It is not a prohibition as an external law which stops the jouissance. It is the act committed by the brothers, which has this consequence. The second difference with Oedipus is that they discover they are brothers. Lacan points out that this is not obvious. Brotherhood is based on segregation. But I quote Lacan, it is just that in society, everything that exists and brotherhood first and foremost is founded on segregation. We can, I think, argue that it is the social bond, that it is to say, that's to say the discourses, which represents this limitation of jouissance, of an effect of the structure, therefore, and no longer because of a law. In his course, An Effort de Poésie, Miller points out that because of the murder of the father, the man does not find the jouissance that there would be. Freud's insistence on the necessity of the murder of the father meant for Lacan that jouissance includes something that must be mortified. In a way, this is how he made the transition from a causal relation to the murder to a relation of equivalence. It's Lacan who made this transition. The dead father is jouissance, similar. That's the equivalence which will be developed in the next chapter. <coughs> Something of the jouissance must be mortified. And of course, for Freud, it is the primitive father, the first father, the Urvater in German of primordial repression. It is this father who must be subtracted, taken out, eliminated, so that enjoyment is bad. The prohibition, which is at the heart of Oedipus, finds its structure when one opposes all of the castrated sons to the father. A father 
obviously imaginary, mythical, a father who would not be castrated. Lacan relies on this model for what he built about jouissance in Seminaire 20, encore. That is what Jacques-Alain Miller points out in his cause, L'être là. And it is a formula of sex, of sexuation, male side. I can also share screen here to let you see this formula. All sons, it's <coughs> for all X, are submitted to, to phallus. It's to say all sons are castrated for all X. Uh, it is in the, in the for all X, feeder X. It's to say for all sons are castrated. But the condition is that all sons, it's also all men are castration, are subject to castration. But it is on the condition that only one is accepted. It's, uh, it exists when X that is not, not feed X. The, uh, the one which is accepted is the Urfather in the Freudian myth. The murder of the father, then the, the, the male side of the formula of sexuation is constructed uh, on the same uh, uh, idea that, the, that the, what Lacan extracts from Totem and Taboo. The murder of the father seems so essential to Freud that he will invent the murder of Moses. <coughs> the murder of Moses in his third myth. Uh, in an intervention what, that he made in one of Miller's causes, Eric Laurent says that the father for Lacan brings together all the contradictions of the Freudian father. He is but, he is but the father of Oedipus, which, who prohibits, the father of the order, who has the jouissance, and the father that shows the way, Moses. And we see that well in this chapter of the seminar. Why does Moses have been killed? asked Lacan. It is so that Moses will return among the prophets via repression, no doubt. With the primary repression, he opens the way for, for transmission to the prophets. Nothing to do with jouissance, specifies Lacan, who adds, we can see that there is a completely different relationship there which is a relationship with truth, the little sister of jouissance. As conclusion, for Oedipus too, the question of truth is essential. If Oedipus comes to a very sticky end, it is because he absolutely wanted to know the truth. It is because he is looking for the truth twice in his response to the Sphinx, and then by questioning Theresias, that he must finally pay the price, that's to say castration. And Lacan concludes this chapter, saying it is not possible seriously to examine the Freudian reference without bringing the dimension of truth to bear, along with murder and jouissance. So we have three, these three terms, truth, murder, and jouissance. In his seminar of the previous, previous year, Lacan also proposes three terms which move from a dimension of historization to structure. I quote him. It's in seminar uh, 16. Then the seminar from another to the, to the other. We take as accepted the relations of tension that are established with respect with a certain number of terms, so as the father, the mother, the, the birth of a brother or a little sister, that we consider as primitive, but that, of course, 
take us on this sense and this weight by the reason of the place they hold in the articulation of knowledge, jouissance, and a certain object, little a. We understand that Lacan goes from the Oedipal family schema to an element, elementary structure. These are the same three terms here in Seminar 17. Knowledge in position of truth, jouissance barred by the murder of the Freudian father, and the object little a as a recovered surplus jouissance. As Miller puts it, the last movement of Lacan's teaching is to substitute for the term forbidden that of impossible of jouissance, to move from myth to structure. We can write a little schema on the link of the three myths and the last Lacan with jouissance. I share my screen therefore for the last time. This is the schema. Oedipus, the, in Oedipus, the father's murder uh, permit the jouissance of the mother. In Totem and Taboo, it barred the jouissance of the mother. In Moses, the murder has no link with jouissance, but transmission. And in the last Lacan, the jouissance, is include, the jouissance includes the loss. And it's then impossible. This impossible. This impossible is already announced in the previous chapter. First, enjoyment is a loss, as Bruno commented. And this impossible will be developed in the next chapter, Bayant of Oedipus Complex, is the passage to Matems of the structure. I thank you. Alexander, we thank you for leading us so delicately along that narrow passage from, from Matems to the Matems of the structure via that delicate balance between knowledge and truth, the, the saying not all that you have managed to elaborate on, let's say leaving us with more questions than answers, and certainly, if anything, directing us back to the reading of the text. Um, we are fortunate today to be able to rely on Rick Losa, member of our sister society, ICLO, the Irish Circle of the Lacanian Orientation, who has agreed today to take on the task of posing an initial question to open the discussion to our panel. And I look forward to hearing your questions, Rick. Thank you very much, Roger. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Roger, thank you very much. And Peggy as well for, uh, for making this uh, all happen. I want to thank... Uh, Alexandra for an absolutely fascinating uh, uh, exploration of this uh, of this chapter, uh, which in itself is is uh, is, is uh, fascinating. Uh, I I have uh, uh, a comment that culminates in a, in a question. It's a, a little bit longer, and I have another question, but there may not be time because I am very very certain that many people may want to come in here because uh, what Alexandre did with this chapter, uh, opening it up and creating all kinds of pathways to think about it is, uh, is uh, really, really interesting. And uh, so if I may just start and then we'll see if, if, if there is time for the second question at some point. Uh, but um, uh, just to, to say something about uh, the last section of this uh, this chapter that uh, also Alexandre uh, spoke about, uh, the, the three myths. And uh, um, it, again, I find it uh, very interesting what Alexandre said, and it's a very interesting uh, section. Um, and he, he Lacan, there begins uh, this section by... I, by the way, I'll try and speak slowly because my natural inclination is uh, not to. Um, Lacan begins this section by talking about the, the mother's desire. And then he refers to 
Freud's father of the horde, the primal father, and then says Freud, Freud clings to it. He then refers to the Oedipus as a myth and says that the myth is manifest, it's not latent. Uh, as Alexandre said, there is something uh, uh, analyzable there that pertains to, to uh, Freud's desire. And uh, as uh, Alexandre said, he calls the father of the horde, the primal father story, a cock and bull one. And at the end, he, uh, he says, uh, Oedipus is uh, Freud's dream. With regards to Moses, uh, he says it's fascinating as other aspects of Freud's work. So uh, I wonder, does that mean that at this stage he reserves a, a completely different judgment for Moses uh, uh, than he does for Oedipus and Totem and, and Taboo, though he takes these three myths together? And uh, my question is why uh, Marie-Hélène, various, various other people, have said Seminar 17 is political. And perhaps something similar can be said uh, of Freud's Moses. Uh, it was published in, I think, 39, just before the start of the Second World War. He was uh, advised against publishing it, but insisted politics in the interbellum between the two world wars had utterly failed. The real politique had utterly failed. And here I think in this book, Freud, uh, uh, Freud's unstated question may be, although I'm not certain about this, how was Moses something of a true uh, leader, but uh, a leader in the sense of someone who through creating a new signifier, is able to dignify uh, the relationships, the bonds between people, as he did for the Semites, uh, such that a new life was created for them. But I think there is more to Moses uh, than there is to Oedipus and the primal father of the horde. It concerns uh, Freud's rock, his stumbling block, and I will try and be brief here and, and, and then pose my question. Uh, dur during the week reading this lesson, I decided to look uh, back at Moses and again, uh, at some, uh, also some notes I made uh, in the past. And Moses Freud summarizes twice totem and taboo, but he does it by thinking in stages. And uh, there are five stages, I'm not going to mention them, but uh, I will mention the fourth stage because here he introduced something that was, I think, not so explicit in the cock and bull story of Totem and Taboo. What has been introduced between stage three, which is about the breakdown of the father function, the primal father, and stage five, the last stage, the resurrection of the father function via symbolic representation, in stage four, he talks about matriarchy and the power of women. And so the crucial difference between Totem and Taboo and Moses is that Freud, albeit perhaps fleetingly, created a space for femininity and feminine jouissance. I suppose my question is the following. Does put Lacan uh, uh, Moses at a different level? than Oedipus and the father of the horde because of politics, the politics of the student workers and so on, looking for a revolution uh, and thus looking for a master on the one hand and on the other, the politics of the field of jouissance, including feminine jouissance. In other words, is there something in Moses that also allows Lacan to open up or to consider new pathways beyond the father beyond Freud's dream, or to translate this question to very recent time, pandemic times, is true leadership not veering in the direction of the feminine, which is uh, something that actually came up in a discussion uh, yesterday in uh, Oceanique. Those, those are my questions pertaining to that uh, section. I, I hope you, I spoke slow enough, uh, sure, Alexander. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, perhaps not uh, directly responsible to make a lead. Uh, of course, there's a, a very important difference between the two first myth and the third. 
and it's it's clear the two first meet are uh, <coughs> are based on the the question how to limit jouissance, how to civilize, how to civilize uh, with a master, how to civilize the civiliz the civilization coming the act of civilization coming from a master, from a father. From a, a father, it's not the same as a master, but let us say it is a kind of first master. Of, uh, it's the question of the urfather mm -hmm. of it. The, with Moses, it is, it, it is not the same. It is also a question of civilization but not first how to limit jouissance. It's a question of civilization introducing a new way, mm. not the same as cutting jouissance at the beginning, but how to introduce a new way. So you are you're right, it's a political text. The two first are also political texts, but uh, it is not for us the same orientation in politics. The first texts are Politic, but in the meaning that uh, that there is a master. The second, the, the third text is of uh, Moses, is politic uh, with more opening to how to to give new signifier to open a way. And uh, yes. I thought to I thought to uh, uh, a text of Miller when you are when you were speaking now. Uh, Rick, uh, it is in French, I don't know is it, if it exists in English or not. In French, it's a little text named Du Nouveau. Du Nouveau. Du Nouveau. It's, it's a, in fact, it's a text uh, that was first published in uh, Spanish because I think it's a seminar he, he gave in uh, Barcelona many years ago. But in that text, he, he, he propose different function of the father. You have the father who say no. It's the father who limit jouissance. Yes. But what is more important, of, I remember too, <laughs> what is more important is the father who say yes. And that's the father who propose the way, who accept the way proposed by the, the son of the girl, but also propose the way. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, on, on the text of Miller because I think it is in the same direction as what you, it yeah, was yeah. Comes to Moses, but it is the same direction as what you say, uh, Rick. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Alexandre, at, at that point, we, we do have a question waiting from Vincent Dashi, but could I ask you, Alexandre, to say something more about that equivalence posed the dead father is jouissance, which I think is actually one of the central turning points in the argument that you highlighted very well, mm. from the father as agent of prohibition to the father as element of jouissance, then obviously the father's role as agent of prohibition is completely out of play. So could you elaborate a little bit more where you extract that formulation, the dead father equals the, is jouissance? And, and how we see the pieces moving around that, that postulate. Yes, I started that from a comment of Jacques Lamilla, but it is also said by Lacan in the text in the next session, in the next chapter. Then, of course, it will be discussed perhaps uh, uh, next by, by Alicia. <laughs> okay, we, we, we can discuss it when we get. Oh, so, so it's a proposition that is waiting for us. Let us so let us we let it open for Alicia. <laughs> um, Vincent Dashi, I think, had a question. Thank you very much, Alexandre. The question I wanted to ask was this one. It's about myth. About myth. 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 Oh, yeah. myth. Yeah. Do you think we could consider? the dialectic between master and slave that Lacan takes from Hegel as a myth, maybe not analyzed by Lacan as such, 
but nevertheless used as such in this seminar. Uh, it's, <laughs> I find it difficult to respond to because uh, uh, when we say it's a myth, it has, a, in fact, it's possible to have two meanings with that. It's possible that it will say it is only a myth, it is just a myth. Or it's possible to say it is a myth that's very important because it gives us a, it gave us a structure. <laughs> no, no, in the second way, in the second way. Please, please. In the second uh, meaning that you just gave. Yes, sure, I think a myth is, a, is an attempt to say a structure in the real that is not possible to say mm. to another mode and that is not possible to say with a scientific knowledge, with a complete knowledge, then we may say that the master and the slave, the dialectic of the master and the slave in Hegel, uh, we may say it's a myth if we want to say that it is a, an attempt to give uh, an elementary structure of the beginning of the uh, of the dialectical development of civilization. Uh, it's it's of course the master and the slave. It's also around the question of the repartition of jouissance. Uh, but it seems. Yes, we may we may say so, but it is also a, a structural distinction. It is also why not? It's a myth, but in the in the meaning that it see us uh, an elementary structure, not completely, by a way that is possible to tell it us uh, without being uh, able to tell it completely. Alexandra, yeah. you yourself, in the course of your presentation, gave an ultra-reduced definition of a myth, which, which I, a form like, which, as I remember, the myth is an S2 in the position of truth, which I find an absolutely striking formula. I don't know what it is, because it certainly picks up on the theme that comes from, I think, a question from Tammy Weil, I think, was from the second session. What is it about knowledge in the place of truth that's central to the analytic clinic, and the an including the role that myth plays in the analytic clinic? So can you elaborate a bit more on that formulation of myth as an S2 in the position of truth, knowledge in the position of truth, which is a theme that runs through all of these chapters? Uh, <coughs> <coughs> saying that myth is a knowledge in position of truth is not the same as saying that uh, a knowledge in position of truth is always a myth. Hmm? <coughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure that would be right. Bec but what is it to say that a myth is an attempt to give a, a structure to what it is impossible to give completely the structure. It's an attempt to to aim the real, to 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 have a, a view on the real, and on, on the same position uh, of truth for knowledge. We may certainly uh, speak about. Uh, tell, uh, we may certainly also in that place put the interpretation, the analytic interpretation. It is not a bit, but it is also something who is who is who uh, is who aim the real, dans la visée et le réel. The the aim of the interpretation is a real. And uh, for, the, for that reason, it came at the same place. 
an attempt to say something of what it is uh, uh, to say something of about what it is impossible to say everything yeah and we, we, we certainly not then for, yeah. for the, the question uh, uh, of vincent also uh, uh, of course it's difficult to say it's a myth when it is taken in a structure that in Hegel, in a dialectic that uh, is uh, that dialectic that try to be complete. Uh, that's the that's the reason for what it is difficult to say it's a myth. But if you just take the little story master slave and the little structure, we may eventually say that. But I think that taken in the old uh, dialectic of Hegel, it's difficult, difficult to say it's a myth because it's taken in a complete knowledge, in, uh, in an attempt to, to go to the, to the completeness. In terms of the attempt to say it all, we're certainly not going to expect that from you. In fact, I'm I'm hoping that we will okay. hear a little bit from from some of our panelists. I I know Philip Dravis has a question. I, I I'll just make one more remark, if I may, about this idea of truth as uh, of myth as S two in the place of the truth, because in your opening paragraph, quoting from Lacan, on page ninety. In reference to the master's discourse, Lacan speaks about the ultra-reduced myth of being yeah. identical with its own signifier, which, which yeah. is a little provocative to say the least. Yes, yes. Sure. It's an ultra-reduced myth. It gives us the idea that uh, effectively we may, what come in the position of truth as a, a knowledge that come in the position of truth is, uh, is a myth. <laughs> the, 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 the true the truth of the master discourse is that he refused the truth and doesn't have to say everything that he knows phil mm -hmm. did you have a question or a comment well <clears throat> i just wanted to uh, to thank alexander for a fantastic talk and on this point the recent point in the discussion i had a couple of points to make one was to recall um perhaps in particular in relation to knowledge in the place of truth um in the place of a myth um in relation to something that cannot all be said just a reminder that lacan spoke of myth um in on freud's trib uh when he said where he says the drives are our myths uh right. said freud this not must not be understood as a reference to the unreal for it is the real that the drives mythify as myths usually do very important thing to say. He goes on to say, here it is the real which creates desire, in this particular instance, by reproducing in it the relation between the subject and the lost object. So the, the idea that, that the drives are, uh, are the myths of psychoanalysis, you say very interestingly that in psychoanalysis, myths comes to occupy that place of, of knowledge in the place of truth. Um, the Freudian Oedipus as well. I was absolutely delighted that you mentioned uh, uh, Levi-Strauss's structural anthropology of myth and this idea that the myths serve to structure the subject's relation to an impossible. In, in the, in the Levi-Strauss, as you say, this contradiction between two logics, between the logic of the autochthonous origin of man and the idea of sexual reproduction. That is what the, 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 the myths, and uh, above all, the Oedipus myth, serves to do to structure the subject's relation to this impossible. It struck me that um, one could say several things about this, but also in relation to, to the way that the function of the impossible is situated in the discourses in various ways. A final comment, you, you, you draw the, our, our attention to the tables of sexuation by writing the, the side, the masculine side. And I wondered whether, um, whether the this idea of structuring a relation to the impossible is complicated more with the addition of the feminine sexuality, the idea that perhaps Freud, in responding to the, the impossibility with the myth of Oedipus, 
obscures, as like I said in previous chapters, the question of female sexuality. And it's only in subsequent seminars that Lacan begins to, 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 to draw out this reference to uh, feminine sexuality and explore it at greater length. So those are my comments to you, Alexander, uh, as a question, but also as acknowledgement of, and thanks for this fantastic uh, lecture. Yes, thank you for your comment. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, in this in this chapter, with the the, the first two myths of uh, Freud, it's to say Oedipus and Totemen Tabu, we are completely on the male side of the sexual. Uh, of the sex, the formula of the sexuation formula, we are completely on the male side, and the opening to the the other side is uh, perhaps given to Moses, to the text of Moses. But it is not so clear in the text of Lacan in this session uh, of the seminar. I I think Florencia Shanahan had a comment or a question, or apparently not. Alexander, I have seen in the thread a request that you put up your last table with with, with the three myths and, and the, the last one that you showed. People wanted to take a note of it. Um, you, your schema with the three myths and the last Lacan. Yes. Is it possible to put that back on the screen just so yes. the, the audience can have a look at that again? Sure. Uh, this one. I think that is the one that there was a request for. I let um, you go for a moment. <laughs> and then we will leave room for maybe one last comment or question, given that we are approaching the hour. Can I ask? Uh, uh, yes, Rick. Ask, if a very oh, quick question. Oh, Rick, you uh, have a question standing yeah. by. Yes, please. Yeah. please. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Alexander, you spoke about the uh, discourse uh, of of the university, and uh, and here Lacan seems to uh, link the discourse of the university uh, to the discourse of science, to to science, and. Uh, uh, in the discourse of the university, the master is on the place of, of, of truth uh, and in a sense uh, uh, commands keep on knowing. My question is, can the discourse of science also be related to the discourse of hysteria in that the hysteric puts the master to work and uh, uh, to produce a knowledge that is not a means to jouissance, i.e. a knowledge that fits well into the discourse of human science, which uh, is a, a knowledge uh, with, uh, with respect to jouissance and feminine jouissance that is pretty, pretty useless. So as Bruno said, neither Oedipus nor human science uh, can deal with feminine jouissance. Uh, so, so I suppose it can, can the discourse of science also be related to hysteria, to the discourse of hysteria? Yes, uh, uh, you're, you're right. Of course, uh, in, in other, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't remember in which text, but I'm sure that in other texts, Lacan uh, linked the discourse of science to hysteria. Uh -huh. uh, it is in this text, I, I saw that it was it linked it, it's directly to the university discourse, but it depends. Of course, uh, of course, the question of the human science is not so 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 easy to discuss with uh, the question of science. Right? So yeah, it's uh, it's uh, perhaps difficult to discuss it exactly. The question is, what does we know? What does we name? science also uh, is it mathematics physics or other sciences who are, <coughs> which are, are all applied sciences I find it's a it's a big question in fact it's a huge question yes yes but, in but you're right you're right uh, the the discourse of the science 
is not completely the same. Necessary, the, the question of the science is not to, uh, to hear completely at the, at the place of the discourse of university. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, uh, and thank you, Rick. Uh, uh, and what, what's fortunate, shall we say, about our current way of working, the series of working, is it does give us the courage, shall we say, to pose questions that we're not necessarily immediately in a position to, to deal with or to answer, but to know that in the course of our work on these, these questions will recur. And certainly we know that as we go towards the final chapters in this seminar, the question of science and what the discourse of science and technology today might be, take on increasing to some extent come to supplant the focus on the discourse of the university. But I, I myself find it quite striking, let, let's say the work, the, the ambiguity carried by Lacan's reference to the discourse of the university in, in the early chapters, because it's, it's something clearly that he himself hasn't properly formulated. So it's the discourse of the university, but it's the discourse of administration, the discourse of bureaucracy, to some extent, the discourse of the new master, but also the discourse of science. And so we see Lacan to some extent pursuing his own questions and coming up with, with new, not just new answers, but new ways of formulating that question. Mm. And if each of our speakers and our discussion can help each of us formulate for ourselves new ways of asking the questions that come back in the course of our reading of the seminar, then I think the work has been valuable. Um, when I mentioned to start with that we are fortunate through the efforts of Phil Dravers to have the recordings of the seminar soon available, I think in this instance, we will be very privileged to be able to pursue some of the questions that Alexander has raised on our behalf, mm. even via re-listening, but also by taking up the next chapter next week from myth to structure with Alicia Arenas and I think Alan Rowan will take on some of the questions. I look forward to working with you all again next week. Thank you for all your input. Thank you, Alexander. Until next week. Thank you.